This video is about the one sample t test. You will learn about the types of hypotheses, the test statistic, the effect size, and confidence interval for this procedure. We will follow a working example throughout the video to put the t test into context. The website humanbenchmark.com provides a web based reaction time test. This test displays a box on the screen. When you start the test, the screen is red for a random length of time. The participant is to click the box as soon as it turns green. Reaction time is the amount of time in milliseconds that elapses between the display of the green square and the mouse click. According to the website, the mean reaction time is 279 milliseconds. This mean is based on a population of over 43 million people. A statistics professor wanted to know if graduate students had a different reaction time than the general population. Therefore, he randomly selected a sample of 28 graduate students at a university and measured their reaction time using the humanbenchmark.com website. In this problem, we have a single continuous variable, reaction time, and no independent variable. It is suitable for a one sample t test. A first step is to translate the research question into a null and alternative hypothesis. It is better to start with the alternative hypothesis because this hypothesis is the one that should be consistent with the research question. Here we write the alternative hypothesis as the population mean mu does not equal 279. This statement is a formal way to write that the graduate student mean is not the same as the general population. Now we write the null hypothesis to contradict the alternative. According to the null hypothesis, the population mean equals 279. And keep in mind for this example that the population mean mu that's shown in the null and alternative hypothesis is referring to the mean of the population of graduate students. The value 279 is the mean for the general population. This problem is an example of a two-tailed test. Extreme values, both positive and negative, are consistent with the alternative hypothesis. That is, the rejection region is in both tails of the distribution, as shown by the shaded blue regions on the slide. The one sample t test also allows for one sided hypothesis tests. The alternative hypothesis for a lower tail test states that the mean is less than some value. The rejection region is in the lower tail of the distribution. You can see it here shaded in blue. The null must contradict the alternative, therefore the null hypothesis states that the mean is greater than or equal to some value. Notice that we did not say that the mean is only equal to. It would not fully contradict the alternative if we had only written that the null is equal to some value. To completely contradict the alternative hypothesis, the null hypothesis for a lower tail test must state that the mean is greater than or equal to some value. The alternative hypothesis for an upper tail test states that the population mean is greater than some value, and the null hypothesis indicates that the mean is less than or equal to some value. This puts the rejection region in the upper tail of the distribution. Once we have stated the null and alternative hypothesis, in the significance level, we are ready to compute the test statistic. The equation is shown here. To compute it, plug in the sample mean, the population mean, mu0, that is given by the null hypothesis, the sample standard deviation, and the sample size. This test has a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. There is a separate video that explains more about the t distribution. Assumptions for a one sample t test are that the values are randomly sampled from a population that is normally distributed. The dependent variable must be a continuous variable. Returning to the reaction time example, the sample mean is 262.18 and the sample standard deviation is 48.73. The box plot shows that reaction time is positively skewed with a couple of outliers. For a two-sided hypothesis and a significance level of 0.05, the t critical value is 2.052. The critical value 
is obtained with computer software or a table in a statistics book. If our test statistic is more extreme than the critical value, we will reject the null hypothesis. Plugging our sample estimates into the t-test equation, we get a value of negative 1.8265. This value is not more extreme than the critical value, therefore we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So what did we learn from this? We learned that the mean reaction time for graduate students might be 279. We did not prove the null hypothesis to be true. You can never prove it to be true. Either the null hypothesis is true, or our study lacked precision. All we can say is that we did not have enough evidence to reject it. Even if we had rejected it, we would have only learned what the mean is not. That leaves an infinite number of other possibilities. What we really would like to know is the actual value of the parameter. A better research question is, by how much do graduate students' reaction times differ from the general population? Or, what is the mean reaction time for the entire population of graduate students? These are better questions because they focus on an effect size or the actual value of a parameter. To answer these questions, we need additional statistics. Cohen's D is the effect size that we use with a one-sample t-test. It describes the discrepancy between the null and alternative hypothesis in standard deviation units, much like a z-score. It is computed as the sample mean minus the population mean given by the null, and that quantity divided by the sample standard deviation. Note that the denominator is the sample standard deviation. It is not the standard error of the mean. A common mistake is for one to use the standard error instead of the standard deviation. Cohen's D is in the standard deviation units. For example, a value of 1.5 indicates that the sample mean deviates from the mean under the null by one and a half standard deviations. Cohen provided rules of thumb for interpreting his effect size. 0.2 is small, 0.5 is medium, and 0.8 is large. However, these rules of thumb are completely arbitrary. It is much better to compare an effect size to those that have been found in prior research. It is good practice to compute an effect size even if you fail to reject the null hypothesis. That way, people can include your work in a meta-analysis, which is a way of quantitatively synthesizing results of many studies. Confidence intervals should be computed with any hypothesis test. Confidence intervals are discussed in a separate video. Here you see the specific way to calculate a confidence interval for a one-sample t-test. Multiply the standard error by the critical value to get the margin of error. For a two-sided interval, the margin of error is subtracted from the sample mean to get the lower bound. It is added to the sample mean to get the upper bound. For a one-sided test, the margin of error is either added or subtracted from the sample mean, but not both. Returning to the reaction time example, the effect size is negative 0.35. In other words, the sample mean was 0.35 standard deviations below the value we specified under the null. This effect size is on the small side. The confidence interval indicates that the mean reaction time for graduate students is between 243 and 281 milliseconds with 95% confidence. A total of 28 randomly selected graduate students at a university participated in a reaction time study. Their reaction times had a mean of 262.18 milliseconds with a standard deviation of 48.73 milliseconds. Although our sample had a faster reaction time than the general population, we failed to reject the null hypothesis that university students, more generally, have a reaction time that was equal to the general population. The effect size was small at negative 0.35. With 95% confidence, the mean reaction time for graduate students is between 243.28 and 281.08 milliseconds. Every time you conduct a one-sample t-test, follow these steps. State the null and alternative hypothesis. State the significance level. Find the critical value. Compute the test statistic. Compare the test statistic to the critical value and make a decision. 
Alternatively, if you're using a computer for this analysis, the computer will give you the p-value for the test statistic, and you compare that to your significance level. Next, you'll compute the effect size, the confidence interval, and interpret the results.